happy Monday. Um, thanks for thanks for joining our second workshop uh, in our series. Um, this one is the theme of processing. I'm I'm quite interested to see how the conversations develop this week because we're shifting from general researching um, and just kind of collecting to uh, you know what do we theoretically do with that information or that data that we're collecting. Um, so I think a lot of the voices you'll hear from this week um, are more on the side of uh, kind of data collection, data processing. But I think I'm really curious to see how we reflect on these questions and open them up to more um, uh, more topics as well. So just kind of you know data with a big D. Um, so uh, without without talking more about, much more about that, I just want to introduce our workshop leaders this week. We're doing a a collaboration. Um, uh, Maxime and Ricardo have been really, um, really great uh, organizing this. You can see them waving now. Uh, Maxine is joining us from from Los Angeles. Um, Maxime and I were actually uh, classmates and good friends, and, um, and it's great to have him as always as part of the Space Loon team. You've been with us since since the beginning, um, out in the yeah. desert with the giant lidar scanner and drones and things. It's, right. been, it's been great. Um, thanks for thanks for that, Max. and Ricardo. I don't, John. If you want to introduce Ricardo, because <laughs> yeah, so yeah, Ricky and I studied at the same university in Italy. Uh, we both live in Berlin, so we hang out quite often, and uh, that, it has been very interesting to see. Um, so we're. Um, as I mean, drifted away from architecture. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I broke out. You cannot hear me. Uh, oh. We can hear you. Well, I don't know why I don't know what you heard. Anyways. Anyways, I think we can uh, um, I think Ricky is gonna present his work on Wednesday. So just just to say yeah, I'm very happy he's here today. Thanks for inviting. <laughs> So we're we're really we're really looking forward to this this collaboration because it's sort of a passing of the baton. Max is going to speak today, show some of his work, show show a, a, a brief tutorial on photogrammetry, and then um, from the work that's produced in that um, section of the workshop, then Ricardo picks it up, um, and on Wednesday we continue with more um, visual programming and kind of what we do with those photogrammetry models and the data sound data that we're, we'll be uh, prompted to collect. Um, so I think it's going to be a fun little exercise. Um, these guys have put a lot of work in putting it together for you. So um, thanks, everybody, for joining for that. And again, I'll stop blabbing on and, and give the table over to Maxime. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. thanks, Danny. Thanks, Rebecca and Jan, for having me around again this year. It's always a pleasure. Um, it's nice to see you all. Can you, can you all hear me fine? Wave, yeah, perfect. I see some heads nodding. That's good. Um, I'm just going to present my screen now. Um, let's get this started. Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, introducing the, the workshop that uh, Ricky and I have put together. Um, so it's kind of, as Danny said, it's a twofold workshop where in, in, in our portion, uh, the first two days of the week, we will be uh, collecting um, various 3D scans of urban objects. So we'll, we're going to be sending you in your own, uh, sort of safely, in your own urban environments to collect urban objects through photogrammetry and also record sound. Um, using your phones, uh, that's going to be fine. And then after that, with Ricky, you're going to be using these uh, um, data, the, the data that you've collected uh, and process it, manipulate it, and give it a, another life. And so by the end of the week, what we hope to, to have collected is essentially a library of snippets and samples of your own environment that we will then, um, in, this, in, in the second life of this project, um, put in the virtual environment um, um, using gaming platform, for example. Um, so this is the example of objects that you'll be scanning. We um, will be sending you in your own cities, as I said, uh, to collect 
urban objects that have some sort of significance for you in this uh, COVID time and time of quarantine. If if and I hear I'm hearing some of you are on complete lockdown. If, if so, if you can't really go outside. You may take objects from your home. You can may, you may take objects from your stairwells, uh, lobbies. Uh, but ideally, if you can go out, go out of your home and go um, outside, we would like you to go and circulate, and uh, you know get to learn your your cities, um, you know through this this new lens of looking at objects as material that you can sample and you can mine from your cities to accumulate some this a collection of objects. Um, and then eventually, as I said, we were, we were going to try to, you know, build collectively a virtual environment in which we're going to um, lay these objects down and try to create sort of a, um, an, an urban environment or a virtual urban environment. Um, the past two Space Saloon um, editions have been uh, situated in, a, in the high desert of California, so I thought it'd be a good idea to start with the bare bone sort of environment of a desert and then slowly kind of inserting objects uh, that you will have collected over time into this environment to give this sort of like ghost town um, feeling and we like to call this the Wunderkammer um, Ricky I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly but it's sort of a cabinet of curiosity uh, and we really like this idea here's, here's another snippet so that's, that's sort of the general introduction of uh, what we'll be doing over the past, uh, the next few days. Um, and then, as Danny said, Ricky's going to pick it up um, after um, on Wednesday. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, my work, uh, present myself. Hopefully this will be brief because um, I'm more interested in jumping into the next phase and talking about myself for the whole hour. Um, but so as Danny said, we met in school. Um, I'm originally from Montreal uh, in Canada, and then I came here to Los Angeles for school, and this is where I met Danny. Uh, we, came, we became good friends and started working together, shared some interests, developed some research and projects together, which brings me to talk about the first project that I'm going to talk about here that we did uh, collectively with Danny, started in school as a research project. The idea was to pick a site uh, to study under various different lenses, uh, which then led Danny to develop, you know, the very kind of embryonic premises of the project that we we, we are now all partaking in, which is Space Saloon. And then um, on my side, I was I started to be more interested in about the idea of collecting, uh, really just like a hoarder, like collecting a lot of of data and objects and scans and looking at the world as a way, as a, a mining resource, essentially. And so it, this, this, this sort of research of mine started with uh, the themes of the landscape and the desert. Um, so here's a scan. So here's a scan also, the same mountain rock formation. And this was using te techniques of photogrammetry that I'll be introducing today, um, using drone as the method of capture. Um, so we can see here sort of the reconstruction of the model as a sequence uh, from the capture of the drone. All right, okay, you get the idea. Um, and then so, this research, as Danny said, um, led me to, to, to kind of like participate in the first edition of Space Saloon. Um, as kind of a collector of data, essentially, we brought the big LiDAR scanner on site. Um, we did a lot of photogrammetry, and the idea was to collect as much as we could. And so this is a point cloud of, some, of the installation from another team, uh, Palme Architects, which is called Extent, if I believe. Um, Right, so this is just you know a nice and simple rendering of the point cloud that is collected with lidar scanning, um, and then uh, let's talk about the next edition of Space Saloon, which was last year. Um, this one I did with a good friend of mine whose name is Leah, who is also a teammate of ours in school. The idea here um, was to try to hone in on both of our interests, kind of like have two different 
angles on a project that we would do together using the desert as like a set or a stage. So we designed these green screen props here that are all desert themed. So you can see like some cactuses and cactus like shapes. And so the idea was to, around the theme of the desert, to try to represent various sort of imageries of the desert, either physical, uh, analog, digital, gaming, and then try to weave this all in between to give this idea of a cross-virtuality world that exists in both the physical and the digital. Um, so um, this was a very fun one-day workshop that we did on site last year. Um, that had also a subsequent life after as more of a post-processing project. So it existed both as a one-day performance in site, on site, and then as a post-processing project. So here you can see that the performance of the staging. Uh, we had a lot of fun. We were painting each other. Um, you know, it's very very fun. Just kind of let's do it quickly. All right, so now you can kind of see the editing. Um, we're really giving this impression of a bilateral sort of, you know, world that works in and out of one another. And then introducing some, you know, some fun uh, elements like animals, flying sharks, eagles, uh, just as elements like tie everything together. Um, right. Okay, uh, so I talked a lot about landscape capturing. Now I'm gonna talk about sort of like the different scale of what you can do with photogrammetry. So starting at really, really small scale. Um, you know, th those are toys that I bought uh, very cheaply, a $2 Hulk and a $5 Batman. And then the idea was to so for, with photogrammetry, as we'll see, there are kind of like two main type of data that you're going to get from it. One, which is geometrical, um, so or like the actual mesh, and the other one is more like material, which is the texture. And so this project focused more on, on the texture part more so than the geometry. So the geometry wasn't too transformed, per se, but the material is really where we try to work on to gain or to inject sort of this new um, aesthetic to the project. Um, and then so the next project here is also at a different scale, it's the, at the scale of the body, but this project was more playing with the idea of form rather than texture, um, using fashion as sort of a backdrop for references um, for our research. This is this is me, actually, you, you don't really recognize me too, too much, but. Um, the idea was to you know, kind of build and collect props that we would wear to alter the shape of our body, then scan ourselves, reconstruct, deconstruct parts of our body to then you know, put these bodies back, to, back together to create these sort of new avatars that are, you know, that originates from 3D scans, so from physical uh, bodies that are completely you know, transmogrified and changed over, over the course of the project. And then now at bigger scale, uh, the scale of a city. This is a project that uh, I presented um, uh, a year and a half ago with other friends of ours, Roundhouse, um, as part of their public programming series, which was a screening event. The idea here was to, um, the same way that I'd like to mine from the actual world as a source of uh, creativity, I also like to mine from the vast exi existing world of the web. Uh, to dig into the archives and then use this material as, a, as 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 material that I can now take possession of and then uh, use it for my own work. So this is the the, the video that you see here at top of the left top left here is the first the very first capture of Chicago in 1914 shot from an elevated point of view from a zeppelin by Roy Nabinshu. Um, so this was the first time that people were seeing Chicago from from the air. Um, which was quite revolutionary at, at the time. And then what you can do with photogrammetry is you can take this video, which is public archive, break it down into frames, which I'll show you how to do, and then uh, you run it through Agisoft, which is a photogrammetry platform, and then get a point cloud. So here is a point cloud of 1914 Chicago. And then the idea was then to use other sort of you know, 
technologies that we're not going to jump in, which is neural networks and you know, machine learning algorithm to really work on giving this sort of old city a new sort of aesthetic. So I, here is a video of transforming old Chicago into new Chicago and try to give you know, Chicago an in-between sort of life that has a, a pretty weird sort of aesthetic. Um, and obviously the result is quite you know, noisy and dirty, but that's all, only a consequence of the various tools that you use, uh, which I don't mind. I think it gives it a bit of a, an honest vibe you know, as, as, as a trace of what the software, the, the platforms that you've been using. Um, I think this is it. Okay, cool. So this is kind of like a brief overview of some of the work that I've, I have been doing with photogrammetry. So this kind of like is a sampling or a sample of the work that I've done that pertains really much about what we're going to do today. Um, and if, if you guys don't have any questions, I will just go ahead and uh, introducing uh, Agisoft and photogrammetry. Um. Max, maybe before we um, jump into the tutorial, I think it's it's I'm curious um, about everyone's uh, kind of prior knowledge of, of photogrammetry. Like, who's never heard of the term before this workshop? Um, I mean, you can either you can either jump in with the microphone or just write in the chat. Like, if if you know your let's say your experience level with photogrammetry from zero, never heard of it, to like I use it in my practice. Um, and uh, you know, because I think it's a, a really fascinating concept, the way it, it works. And I think the tutorial is definitely going to jump into the, the kind of behind the scenes of why and how this stuff works. But um, I mean, as we go, I, you know, either now or at the end of the tutorial, I think it's important for us to you know discuss it as a just general tool. And I think as we go in the work in the whole week's workshop, those things will come up, and even in the Discord chat. I think it's um. I think the work that you've shown is like fascinating um, in all the different kind of tra trajectories that it can go, um, and uh, curious to see how we all adapt to that or take that up. All right. All right. Oh well, yeah. I mean, it's obviously a tool that has been that I have been using heavily since I first discovered it a few years ago, just because of how easy it is to use, and it's kind of like. Essentially, it's kind of like a camera. It's taking photos of your, it's a new sort of photograph, really. Um, you, you do the same thing as you would do. You take a photograph, but then you can reconstruct it. And then there's another layer of adding your own sort of uh, interpretation uh, and, and creativity in the, in, in the process of how you reconstruct and what you can do with those, those photographs. Um, so um, I find it to be quite fascinating. And, and also, especially sim simple to use and very easy, as you'll see. Um, the work that I showed this morning was really just to give you a broad kind of over sense of what you can, you know, the various different uh, avenues that you can take to, you know, treat and use those data that you'll accumulate. Um, and we will encourage you to be, you know, creative and do your own thing with it. Um, so we have in the chats, we have in the chats here, a majority of people said they've heard of it. Uh, I've never used it. Um, That's great. I have a couple of maybe used it either on their phone um, with certain apps or used it, um, but maybe have not used Agisoft itself. Right, right. So we'll be, yes, um, that's a good segue into, you know, talking about what I wanted to talk about here, which is we'll be using Agisoft um, as, as the platform that I'm the most com comfortable with and which I find to be the most um, you know, performant of all the ones that I, I've tried, but there are others, uh, you know, there's a lot of variety into photogrammetry softwares and, you know, two good ones that I found, which I you know you, you, you may want to look at are Meshroom, which is uh, great because it's a free and open source platform. Um, but unfortunately it's only for windows and it, um, it, it, it takes a lot of it. I find it to, that it takes a lot of time to, process so it's, it's a lot more you know hardware intensive um, and the other thing that you know is a little bit misleading with meshroom or not misleading but you know it's missing some features crucial features that we'll be using in Agisoft for which the workarounds would be too tedious and time consuming to explain um, today but I would highly encourage you to you know try it out download it and see um, 
see it for yourself. It's got a similar sort of, I mean, all of these platforms have similar workflows. It's essentially the same process uh, interfaced differently, um, which is true of the next software, which is Zephyr, which works very similarly to Agisoft. Uh, but just like Agisoft, it's a paid program. What's good with them is they offer a free version of the software, but it, it's only limited to 50 images, 50 photos, which we'll see is not is not a whole lot. We'll we'll aim to have at least, you know, I usually try to have 150 to 200, um, and I say a minimum would be 80, 100. So 50 is really not a whole lot, but it's free. You can download it. You can play with it. Um, so we'll be using Agisoft, and Agisoft is a paid program, but they 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 uh, have a um, free trial, which I will encourage you to download. Um, and it's for every platform, so if you have Windows or Mac or Linux, for some of you, um, you can go ahead. It's a very simple installation. It's a one-click, you know, install uh, pro uh, process. It's very simple. Um, so we'll be the, the tutorial I'm going to be talking about introducing photogrammetry is going to use and focus on Agisoft. So if you want to follow along, I would highly encourage you to download it, or you can try it any other platform. Um, with that said, let's jump, in, jump into it. Um, so just some photogrammetry, how it works. Photogrammetry is is not a precise science. It it works by it's it works by interpolation. So what it wants to do is to approximate or interpolate the position of the camera in space based on features that it is able to recognize from photos to photos. So as you photograph a, an object, you want to um, photograph it under various different angles um, in, on all of the sides so that you can have from photo to photo, overlaps of the features so that the software is able to recognize through the sequence of the photos where the features are on the photos and then interpolating the position of the cam camera by tri by basic triangulation and trigonometry. Right? So photogrammetry is not precise. It's not LIDAR. It's not a precise science. And we don't care for it to be extra, extra precise. We actually like that it isn't because it gives you nice and uh, you know dirty active parts of your uh, mesh, which I find to be interesting, and you know some 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 tricky geometries, uh, which are interesting. Anyways, so that's photogrammetry. So, which brings me to talk about what's very important about the photogrammetry process, which is the capture. Essentially, your 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 three D model or your three D mesh, your scan will be as good as your capture. Um, so I can't you know uh, reinforce this as much. Uh, too much, you know. It's your mesh is really as good as your as your as how good you are to, to capture it in the field. And a technique that is common commonly used is the spherical capture or the dome capture, which is you literally circulate around your objects at various different heights and you try to capture all angles of your object, um, which is what we'll encourage you to do. And here I'm going to show you some examples of of. Um, some of my captures. So if we go here, you can kind of see uh, this is so for the for you know just like you will do this exercise. I did the exercise myself, and when I was looking at finding an object that had some specific meaning to me in these times of COVID, you know this is my building that you see in the background. This is where I live, and on my balcony, which is on the fourth floor, you can't see, I see these mailboxes and the news box every single time, every morning, every lunch. And I've been thinking about this mailbox and this news box, which is constantly empty all the damn time. So this, this object has, <laughs> has gained some sort of new significance for me. So I was like, let's go capture it. Let's go out there and, and um, scan it. Um, and so what I did is I basically, you don't need a, a top-notch camera to do photogrammetry. You can use your phone, which is what I did. I took my phone out there, and I went around, and I took a series of photographs from all angles. Right, so you go around it. There's about 150 of them. Right, you can see here, usually you don't want that. You'd like to have the entire object. 
but it so photogrammetry will still give you a result. It's not because it can't see that it's going to crash. It's just going to not going to give you as much information. Uh, so, which is why I said that your capture is good. Your your scan is as good as your capture. You really want to try to work on how you capture everything. You can see here that I, I cut out the feed, which is not ideal. Um, this, it'll, but it'll still give you a good result. You know, so, so that's technique one to do your capture, uh, which is kind of long and tedious, you know, taking photos. So a workaround that I've come up with, well, actually, I didn't come up with it. People have been using for a long time, which I think to be quite clever, is to do, instead of, a, of taking photos, is you take a video. Um, and actually, I kind of lied when I said this was a, a series of photographs before. It's, it's actually a video that I took. Um, it's a minute and a half uh, from my, with my phone. Um, I, I, I circulated around it from various different angles. You know, as you get to see at the end, I get to the top of it. Um, so you really want to try to capture everything. You kind of look silly out there. People honk at you, but that's, you know, that's just the nature of it. <laughs> and then once, once you have a video like this, uh, you can import it into, um, you know, basic video editing software. For those of you who have skills uh, with, you know, any, I use After Effects, and I'll just show you very quickly how to do that if you want to do that. Um, but it's not mandatory. If you want to take photographs, that's very simple, and that works just as well. Um, let take a second. So what you do is you drag and drop your video in here. Drag and drop it here. You see a composition now appeared. You go composition, composition settings. Um, here you, see, you can see that you have 30 frames a second at a minute and 30 seconds. That's 90. 90 seconds at 30 frames, that's way too many pictures. You want around, you know, I said 150, 200. So I know that if I do two frames a second at 90 seconds, that's about 180 frames, which is, you know, a good number. You zoom out a little, you capture the entire thing. Um, you can see now if you press play, you have two frames per second, which is great. Kind of like the series of photographs that I showed you. You go composition. Add to render queue. It shows up here. You click here on lost list. You want it. You want to export it as a JPEG sequence. You click OK, and then you uh, give it a location, which is you know I've already done this. So it's, um, right frames. You select the location. You click save, and then you click render, and it'll export the video that you took um, as a JPEG sequence. So you'll get your frames. So those are the two techniques. You either take photos or you take a video and then you extract the frames from it. And you'll, you'll get the same sort of result. And so now that you've taken your capture, you're ready to jump into Agisoft, which was what, what we're going to do. And so the, the, the software that I um, encourage you to download is it's called Agisoft Metashape. Metashape is the latest version of the software. Um, extremely powerful and, and actually much faster than the previous edition, which is great. So you can see now the interface is quite, um, it's not really complicated. Uh, you really need to focus on two sort of windows. The first one is the workspace on the left is where you'll drop your photos and you'll see the different sort of sequence of the different steps that we'll, that we'll work on. And then the main sort of viewport is this one, which is your work, you know, your model space, which is where you'll see the point clouds, the mesh, and um, your model, essentially. So because photogrammetry works by inter interpolating the position of the camera, that's the first step that it'll want to do. Uh, so you need to give it a series of frames um, in, in, or photos. Uh, do that two ways. You, you either go workflow, and workflow will become your best friend. This is you know where you can see all of the steps, because Agisoft is a sequentially organized program. It works by step. So you will we'll be building all these steps together. And you can see they're all grayed out here. I can't click on any of them. 
that's because uh, we haven't done the first step yet, which is to add the photos. So you click here, you go add photos, you select all of the photos or the frames uh, from your sequence that you want, and you click open. So you either do that or you go, you navigate to your folder on your computer um, here, and you select all of them, and you drag and drop them in the workspace. It'll work the same way. You can see now here in chunk two, you have your all your photos. It says that none of them are aligned right now because we haven't done that yet. But you can see this is your sequence that's been imported. Oh, three D not available. Oh, it's not loaded yet. Anyway, so your sequence is, is here now. So you're ready to do the next step, which is to align the photos, which is essentially what I was talking about, aligning or finding the position of the camera in space. Uh, so you click on that, align photos, and for all of these steps, I will encourage you to try, you know, different settings, but the basic settings are more than okay, they work really well, everything is set to medium, which is not too time consuming, but it's also not too low res, um, or of low resolution, so you can, you can just do the whole thing with medium or the basic settings, the basic settings um, enabled, and it'll give you a good result. Um, so for the sake of this, we'll, we'll try to, I'm just going to go ahead and use the basic settings, but I encourage you to try different things. I'm not going to click OK, but because it's going to take a few minutes, and I have already done this. And for the sake of the tutorial, we're just going to waste too much time if I do that. Um, but what you would do is you click OK, and then you would wait. Uh, and it varies from, it varies uh, from, well, it depends on your computer and the hardware that you have. Um, for me, which I have like a, I have a pretty decent laptop, and this phase takes me about two to five minutes, but it can go anywhere from you know two to five minutes to half an hour, depending on what you have. Um, so photogrammetry is definitely kind of a time consuming. It's a simple process, but it is time consuming in the sense that the computer has to calculate. It's kind of like rendering. You, you hit a button, you have to go eat a sandwich, and then come back half an hour later to to see what it's cooked. Yeah. So you would click OK, you would wait, and then um, what you would get is uh, is this, which is a point cloud, uh, which they call the sparse cloud, which is a not dense cloud. And you can see that it has given you every point in the space that it was able to recognize from the alignment of the photos. And you can see that the you know, the mailbox in the, in the news box here that we've scanned, which was the sub subject, is ob obviously the kind of point of focus or where the, L, the points are denser because that's what we photograph the most. You can see here traces of the building I live in in the background, not very dense. You can see here, I don't know, like bushes in the background. You can see the street. Um, so, you know. This is, so yeah, this is the first step that you'll do. And then the second step, well, actually, before going to the second step, what I like to do now, I encourage you to do the same. You can see here in the bottom right is uh, sort of the Euclidean typical three axis space. And what you would want to do, or what's, it, what's helpful, is to align the object or the point cloud with the axis. You can see that you're out of orientation completely right now, meaning that if you're to export anything, then if you're to import it later in another platform, it's going to be misoriented, um, which you can work on later if you want. But it's, I find it to be easier to work on it here so that it becomes built into the object that it has a proper orientation. Because as we said, photogrammetry, um, is not entirely precise. It doesn't know exactly. It doesn't have a coordinate system. You can you can work on that by injecting what we call metadata into the initial capture, um, but you don't have to do that. Uh, metadata is sort of like the built-in data of either GPS, uh, your, the camera type, the lens that you have from your camera, which will help your capture be more and more precise or of better quality. Uh, but is not necessarily mandatory. You can work, it works really well without it anyway. So what you want to do here is approximate, you know, I'm looking on the, on, on, on the bottom right here, X, Y, Z. Y in many software is the axis that is up. 
Um, and Adesop also is no exception to that. So what you want to do is try to align X and Y as best as you can with Z going in the opposite direction. Um, so Z here, like this, this looks pretty good. You can see that your object is completely out of orientation. So you have a few tools here to help you, you know, clean up your model, rotate, edit it, um, which will which will become you know some of your good friends too. Uh, and the third one here is called is is about the object. You can either move the object, scale the object, rotate the object. We're interested in rotating it because we want to align it. You can see the sphere. The sphere here pops up pops up in the middle. You can use it around to move around your object, and you can see that your axis is not moving anymore. That's, this has been frozen. So what you're you, what you're moving is really just the object. So um, we'll want to try to orient it as best as we can. All right, just like this. All right, this looks pretty good. If you go back here to the arrow, or if you hit Control and Shift, um, you'll be able to go back to scene view, which is to rotate the entire thing. You can see now your axis is also rotating. That's because you're rotating your scene and not your object anymore. We'll go into the top view. Now you can see that you're slightly out of alignment. We'll go back to rotating your object. And we'll you know, try to say as best we can. You can zoom in if you want. This looks pretty good. Um, the next thing we'll want to do, so the next phase essentially is to you know, get a denser point cloud or a better point cloud or a higher resolution with a lot of points. You can see now in your entire scene, you have in the lower left here 140,000 points. It may sound like a lot, but it's really not that many. Um, we'll work with point clouds that will have at least 2 million points. Um, and we've already worked through this workflow with Ricky, um, who's going to work on trying to process and edit the whole thing on Wednesday. And we, um, we figured out that that was, a, that was an OK number of points. So as I said, you want to get a dancer point cloud. What you want to do here is to go to workflow and build dance cloud. But if you're to do that right now, it'll calculate um, essentially, what it'll calculate is uh, what's inside this box here, which is the region. And that's the next thing that you'll want to work on before clicking on this build, build dense cloud. But you, because you can see that your, your region, your box, is a lot bigger than what you're really interested in, right? which is just these two objects here. So you'll want to you know, make this box as tight to your objects or the, the, what you want to scan so that you don't um, compute points that are useless to you. So you go, you do that by going here next to objects. You have the region here. See, move region, resize region, rotate region. So you'll we'll first try to orient the region. You can see now I'm rotating the box um, in the same alignment as uh, the point cloud, right? So you just go like this, we'll, we'll rotate. And then the next thing you'll do is resize. You can see now, you know, you have control points for the box that appeared. You can just click and drag them. This. You go back to scene view. Resize. Click right here. Okay, I want a little too far here. So. Right. So now, if you're to build the next page, which, which we're almost ready to do, you'll only calculate the points that are inside the box. You'll get rid of everything else around it, which is, you know, um, not really necessary to you anyway. All right. So we're ready. So you go again. Workflow. Build. You can build your mesh from this point cloud if you would want, but it would give you a not so high resolution mesh, but it'll work. Um, so and if you want to try, by all means, try. But for, what we're interested in is getting a dancer cloud first before building the mesh. So you go here, build dance cloud. And again, you're, you're, pro, you're presented with a you know, window of settings. The, the, the basic settings, as I said, are fine, just set to medium. And you want to make sure this is ticked. Uh, checked the calculate point colors. 
um, so that the points in your scene retained or color information that, that have been extracted from the photographs. So you would click OK. And uh, I'm not going to click OK because this is the step that takes the longest time. Um, so for me, this step takes about half an hour, maybe 40 minutes. Um, so it may take more or less time for you. But essentially, click OK, and then you wait. And what you would get is, well, what you, so you would get the same thing, essentially. Uh, or what appears to you is the same thing. That's because you have to select uh, what you are viewing in the viewport here by by going up here, do you have a couple of different um, options? So right now you're on 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 point, on point cloud, which is the sparse cloud. You can see four dots. The next one is dense cloud, which is nine dots. Just a, that's a visual cue. But now that it has been calculated, you're like, where? Where's my dense cloud? But you have to select it first. Um, so, so if you click on it, then you can see your much much higher resolution point cloud. You can see it's a point cloud, it's not a mesh. Um, and it's only within the box that you set as a boundary, right? The, all of the other points are gone, um, which is good. Um, so, and at each step, you know, I would encourage you to save, right? It's important to save at each step of the project. You never know when things kind of crash on you, um, as I'm sure you guys all know by now. Um, so, now that you have your your dance cloud, there is. There's the second step, which I find to be the most important in the workflow, which is, and it's an often overlooked step, which is to clean your point cloud um, as best as you can, because your your point your final output, your final object will be as good as your initial capture, yes, but also as good as how you clean it up uh, before you build your your mesh. So. Um, what we're interested in really is just this mailbox and just this news box. Uh, you can keep the ground if you want. I'm not really interested in the ground. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and um, delete it by going here. There's a selection tool. And the free form selection tool will become your absolute best friend, especially in COVID time. So you click on it. You select basically the entire ground. Uh, and click delete. There you go, it's all gone. And you want to get rid of all these points here. Because if you don't get rid of those, then they'll, they'll, they'll be part of the model that will be calculated in the next phase, which is the mesh. So you'll have weird triangulation of your mesh here that's going to extend past the limit of you know, or the boundaries of your model. So you want to get rid of all of those. So this is kind of a long and tedious process. But it, as I said, it's very it's crucial for the quality of the model that you want to do. So you want to get in there, get in there really, and just like delete every sort of point that you deem to be uh, not too good. You know, you know, so I would get in. I'm not gonna, you know, this is a tedious process. I'm not gonna do the entire thing. But like you would really go in here, you know, spend some time, put some good music on because uh, it's kind of like brainless work, and clean it up as best as you can. You know, all these points here, all the ground, you can select another one here, rectangle, you go like this. Um, all right. Okay, anyways, you get the idea. I've already all done this, but I would really get in there and, and clean it up as best as I can. Okay, so after you've done that, what you have here is a pretty good, pretty clean point cloud, um, which you know is mesh ready at this point. Um, again, I would encourage you to save at this point before, before, before and after each step. You know, Control S. All the time. So we're ready to go back to workflow, and then now we're ready to build our mesh. So you click on Build Mesh, and again. You have a bunch of settings. Uh, what you, you can leave the basic settings, um, as I said, uh, to medium. The only thing that's important here is that the source data is set to dense cloud, right? You can also select the sparse cloud if you wanted, but the dense cloud is what you know we're interested in. Depth maps we haven't calculated that doesn't matter. Don't use that. Dense cloud, right? You click OK, and then again you wait. This is the second longest step in the process. 
So go do some laundry, I don't know, uh, go protest in the street, whatever, what have you. Um, come back and then you'll have a, a mesh, which will look, again, well, it won't, it won't appear right away, but you'll see it's still your dance cloud because you have to select it. So here now, if you go next to the dance cloud, you have mesh, if you click on here, uh, you see model solid, right? So now the mesh is here, it's ready, it looks pretty good. It's, it's not so clean in the areas where you have reflective materials or transparent materials. Here you can see in the cavity, I wasn't so good to really get in there in the capture. Um, so it like it, it's not as precise as the rest of the, as the object. Uh, but it's pretty good, it's workable file. Um, and for what we're interested in, it's more than okay. Um, and then you, there's another option here, which is model shaded. Um, this it's not a textured model, it's a colored mesh, meaning that the faces of the mesh, the mesh is a, you know, triangulated surfaces, right? You can see all of the mesh faces, the vertices here have been colored. Um, so it's not a proper texture. It won't give you a texture file when you export it, it's just a colored mesh. So, which I find it to be deceiving, so I always work, I always like to work with the solid. Um, Right, so now the next phase essentially is to build a texture. As I said at the beginning, you know, there are two main sort of output that you want to get from this, which is a mesh file, which is the geometrical file of your object, and then uh, a JPEG, PNG, TIFF file, which, is, which will be the texture that you'll be able to apply to your um, mesh in other platforms and other softwares of your choosing after. Um, so what we're what we're gonna do here is go back to workflow, and then you can see now build texture has appeared. You can build your texture, and there, if you click on that, there are two types of texture that you can build with the latest Edge soft uh, that you can do before. The diffuse map is basically your colored uh, is what you would expect is your colored texture. Um, so we're gonna start by doing that, and then after that, we'll be doing the occlusion map. Uh, which in other softwares is called the cavity map and the diffusion, which essentially is, um, will give you a grayscale texture that will tell you which part of the model will, uh, are, 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 you know, exposed to direct lighting and which parts aren't, uh, so that when you render your objects, it gives you a more realistic sort of uh, feel to it. So we're start by a diffuse map. This is the only time where I actually change the default settings. Default settings are at 4096, 4K. I, I, I've, I mean, through the, the years of using this, I've, I've started, I kind of learned that I prefer to have a really high resolution texture um, rather than having a really, really high resolution mesh because mesh files are extremely heavy and time consuming and uh, hard to compute for your hardware. Whereas JPEG, you know, texture files are just JPEGs are much, much, much lighter. So I, it's kind of like a fine line of where you can get the highest of resolution in your rendering. I find that, that if you work on the resolution of your JPEG, it, it, it's kind of like a workaround to having a not so heavy model, but a very high resolution uh, output. So I like to up that resolution by, you know, 200% essentially, so I go 1,192. You can you can leave the basic settings. Um, you know, it'll work. It'll give you good results. It's just something that I like to do. I like to have a really high res, um, you know, texture. So I click out, and then here advance doesn't doesn't matter too much. Um, you would you would click OK, uh, and then you would wait again. I've already done this, so I'm not gonna you know uh, wait for too long. And you would, again, it wouldn't appear right away. Uh, you'd have to go here in your model and click now model texture. You can see the fuse map has been uh, selected. You go model textured. And now you can see your model has been textured. It's different from the other one, right, which was the shaded, which was a colored mesh. It's not high, as high resolution. This one is much, much higher resolution. You can see the material. Um, looks pretty good. Uh, you can recognize all the features of the mailbox. The PDs are pretty good. Um, and then you, 
same with the, the, the news box, newspaper box here. You can see where, you know, I didn't do such a good job at the capture, which is what I was telling in the beginning, that it's important to be a cap good capture. I didn't go underneath, under under there, to capture the underside of the box, which is where you can see you have, you know, lower resolution area. But again, it doesn't really matter to me. Um, so it really depends on what kind of output you want to, you know, you have to envision or you want to have in order to do a proper capture. And you could, just like you clean your point, your point cloud, you can do the same here, go three point selection and select some some areas here. But you, what you would do here is actually delete parts of your mesh, your final object. So I don't really like to do that, but you can if you want. You can see now you have unclean edges. So I, I tend not to do that and keep it as is. Um, which is, as I said, not, not a too much, uh, it doesn't bother me too much. Okay, so now essentially we've worked through the workflow of building your um, your 3D scans. You know, it's not necessarily complicated. It's actually, you know, step-by-step step pretty simple. It does take some time, um, but I, I think it's pretty simple. Now we're, what we're, we're ready to do is to essentially export uh, those, those um, you know, your capture. So you do that by going file, you know, export. And there are two things that we'll want to export for Wednesday. Uh, the first thing is the point cloud. And the second thing is the model, and the model with the texture. So you'll have three three sort of types of files. First thing is the, ex, the, the point cloud, all right? So you go export points, and then you create a new folder. You call it, you know, I, I, I like to call it export to keep my file, you know, my nomenclature pretty tidy. Uh, so let's just say you know, export is two images. Um, here you give it a name, LA news box, and then you will want to select as a file extension a PLY for your point cloud. And you say save. And here you will want to keep all the basic settings on, on which is to save the point normal, save the point colors, um, and a JPEG format. Uh, well, actually, in here it doesn't really matter uh, because you know you're not going to get pictures, but you just leave it on. You click OK, and then it'll give you here you can navigate to your folder that you've just created. Um, you can see now you have a PLY file which is your point cloud. Now we're ready to explore the other part, which is the model itself. And we'll, we'll be exporting that as two and two file extensions for Ricky, um, for, for Ricky to do his next step. Uh, we worked together to find like the best sort of extensions for you to work with. And so we'll be exporting OBJ's, OBJ file, um, and also FBX file, which is a Autodesk file, oh, Autodesk, yeah. So let's start. Let's start with OBJ. Uh, let's give it the same name. LA news box. I'm calling LA news one. I'm calling it on mesh. Uh, not here. Line. OBJ. You go save in the same folder. And you want to in your settings here. You want to keep your vertex color. You want to export the texture as a JPEG. Um, you want to click OK. I, now that I'm thinking of it, I, I forgot a very quick step, which is, you know, when I when I talked to you about the textures, I said you, there are two textures that you could export, and we only did one. But you essentially, you would do the, the exact same thing with the other one, which is occlusion map. You would click OK, uh, and then you would wait, and it would give you something like this. I already did that, so I won't, I won't, I won't compute it again. But it's a grayscale uh, texture. Right, of the cavities of the, your object, you can see in here light is not going to get in here. Um, so it's essentially kind of like a contrast map. Um, so when you export the textures, you're also going to get an occlusion map. Right. So now that we've exported our model, you can see you have your your point cloud. You also have your OBJ file, which which comes with a material MPL file, and then you have your two your two textures. You have your diffuse, your colored texture, and then you have your occlusion map texture. 
And the last step is, which is to re-export um, the model with the other file extension, which is FTX. I'm going to call it the same name. Save in the same folder, same settings. Click OK. And you can see here now you have your OBJ here and you have your FTX your FBX here. And then essentially, this is what we'll be we're going to be asking from you for Wednesday. You guys will go um, outside in your own sort of environment. You'll pick an object that has some meaning to you. Um, and I'll show you just like briefly some other examples. And then you'll go through this process. And then ideally, each of you will have at least one, minimum one, by Wednesday so that you'll be able to do the next step. If you want to have more, two or three or four or a hundred, what have you, it's up to you. Uh, but we'll encourage you to at least have a minimum of one. And simultaneously, while you're out there taking photos and uh, you know scanning your objects, we'll want you to record uh, sounds of your of this you know of your surroundings. Um, because on Wednesday with Ricky, you'll be manipulating these objects, but you'll also be manipulating sounds. Um, and so you know with your phone, take a video, uh, hit audio record of you know snippets of sounds that have some importance to you uh, or that are traits that char characterizes your own in urban environment. Uh, it could be birds chirping on the branch, it could be the sound of you know water flowing the river uh, next door or you know the auto bus passing by in a very busy intersection, you know you, you pick your own. So by for Wednesday, we'd like you to have like, one of these, you know, 3D scan and one of these uh, sound capture for the next step. I'll just show you, you know, very quickly other, um, just for you to you know, have a, you know, a sense of, of other models that I've done. And I'll also make this all accessible for you so you'll be able to, you know, open them, download them and open them yourselves to see kind of like, uh, you know, an example of some models. It's, it's open up here. The fire hydrant is a good one. I really like this model. It's really high res. It, it's got a really nice material, um, nice feel to it. So this is a textured model. The dense the dense cloud looks like this. It, it, it was done with the same workflow, and that's the space the sparse cloud. And, and then if you want to work bigger scale um, we talked about is you guys can scan you know trees or facades what have you like up to you um, the only thing with buildings and I'll show you an example is it's really hard to get around your building in its entirety and also your your point clouds are going to be much 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 heavier like we had I didn't. I didn't show you, but for the, the the mailbox that we have, we have two million points. Here we have forty million points, right? So it's a much much heavier um, model. But I mean, if you want to experiment with it, do some facade scanning. Go ahead. Uh, we'll, you know, it's, it's, we'll be interested in seeing the results. So this is on. Uh, this is in LA. On I think it's Main Street or a hill, I'm not too sure. Uh, you, I only get two sides of the building because there's another building here I can get the facade. Um, right, you can see that building is, is a little bit more difficult to scan. You see balconies aren't so precise. You know, windows, reflective materials. You can't, you can't see the top here of the sign. Um, but still pretty high resolution, pretty good. So that's the fine cloud and the, the model here, textured models here. You can see the brick is really nice. The, the mural here came out really good. So, yeah, cool. So, you know, basically here, here is the, you know, that was the workflow of Microsoft. It's pretty straightforward. It is time consuming. Um, I will also give you, I think this is being recorded, so you'll be able to, you know, go back and stop, press pause, and do each step. And I will also give you a PDF, essentially, which goes, you know, step by step, you know, in the process. Um, 
you know, to help you with, you know, have, making your own scan. And I will, yeah, as I said, I will also give you access to some of some other files. There's there are four uh, Azure Soft files here that you'll have access to um, as examples. And what else? What else? Uh, I can give you a snippet of no, just for fun of what we hope to do. So. What I why why I really like these these, these workshops uh, with Space Saloon, um, especially is that it's kind of I, and I see these workshops as being a bilateral sort of um, you know workshop, whereas you guys are learning stuff and I also want to be learning stuff. So I I, I want to take on a project that is both beneficial for you but also for me. Um, so I'm very new with game engines, and I wanted to learn game engines. So I, we came up with this project, which is to collect essentially a, a vast collection of objects, and then that we'll be dropping in a virtual environment to recreate a sort of multi-bodied uh, virtual environment comprised of bits of each of your own, which will be very interesting in itself. Um, and also along the along the now, along this process, I also get to learn uh, something myself, which is this you know, game environment. So uh, this is, you'll set the moment, give it a second, it has to load. But it, it's a pretty bare bone world at the moment, uh, which will populate uh, after, uh, after this week. And it's not necessarily part of this workshop. Uh, it will come after, but if some of you are, well, are or will be interested in sticking around and helping me with building this world together, uh, we'll be able to discuss, you know, find a way to progress the work together. Um, so, yeah, there you have it. Especially if some of you have experience with game engines and Unreal, I mean, you guys are more than welcome to stick around. You can see this is the fire hydrant that I showed you. This is the address where I found it. Um, this is the mailbox that we've been working on, right, so you can recognize. So it's a, like I said, it's a pretty bare bone world. You can see the rocks in the background are rocks that I showed at the beginning that I scanned from the desert in, uh, in you know, the last years of space room. Um, so essentially, you know, we'll be pop. It's pretty bare, as I said right now, but we'll be populating this world with all of the objects that you'll be collecting, and then we'll be recreating this sort of urban environment in, in this uh, you know, high Californian type sort of desert. Anyway, so it's just to give you a snippet at what will come next if you want to stick around. And um, I think that's pretty much it. I, I realize this may be you know, quite technical, and I spoke a lot, and that's maybe I spoke too fast in some areas. Um, I don't know if you guys have any questions. Um, I hope this was clear. Um, I'll be available on Discord if, for any of your questions. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram, and, you know, slide into my DM if you have some questions too. Um, what have you, you know, like I'll be accessible um, to answer your questions as best as I can. I am working full time and I am late to work at the moment, but I'll try to you know, do my best to be as accessible um, as I can in the next few days. And yeah, again, on Wednesday, if you can come in uh, to the workshop at the same time uh, with uh, one of those captures and the sound capture, then it'll help Ricky do his part of the workshop, which will be also super fun. You'll be learning about how to essentially take the material that you will have accumulated with this, you know, in this phase, and then basically have fun with it, process it, manipulate it. And Ricky, I haven't really showed examples of, because of, we've been working together uh, to, to organize this workshop, and, but I haven't really shown uh, exactly what he has uh, intended, only because I want, I want him to show it to you on Wednesday, and we can kind of like cultivate the mystery. Yes, is that good with you, Ricky? No, I think it's it's fine. Uh, I think we should keep some uh, mysterious, some suspense on the outcome. I don't know. Perfect. Perfect. 
Um, and I guess we will be creating a folder for you to drop in uh, all of your materials. Uh, and if you could keep it you know, somewhat tidy, because you don't want to overload everyone's hard drives with you know, working files, I think what we, you, what we would need to drop in is just the export files, right? Just like the FBX, the OBJ, and the JPEGs, and the point cloud. And I think you can keep Max, we'll, and we'll, also, uh, we'll set up an easy way to do that. So everyone okay, can, perfect. don't worry. Okay, yeah. um, All right, well, yeah, that sums it up then. Yeah, th thank you, Max. I think it was, it was great. Um, and it's uh, like the video round of applause. Um, uh, I, I think uh, it's, it's nice to kind of see the, the workflow um, without us simultaneously maybe going through it right now. Um, just to remind everyone that the video will be uploaded as soon as we can, and the PDF tutorial, which Max put a lot of time into, we'll share right away, so you guys can all follow in your own your own ways. Um, okay. There are a couple questions in the chat that I'm just seeing. Um, okay. I think um, I think the trial version of Adresoft actually wasn't in the link, uh, so apologies for that. But um, I just put up another link at the end of the document, and maybe it's the beginning of Max's. Because um, I think when you go to that installer, Max, it, it doesn't show you the trial version. Oh, I can't. I guess you have to click on the top right to try it now. No, it's, it's embedded. I always have to just Google um, Adresoft uh, trial. But I put a link at the very bottom of the document that we shared with everyone. So okay, my bad. Sorry, apologies. You do have to you do have to put in your name and email, and you'll get an email later. Um, I don't know how long it takes, but um, you know the, the link's there. So, right. uh, well, I downloaded that one, and just when I open uh, the software, I just put thirty days trial version. Yeah, and exactly. I can use it. That's okay. what I did too. I'm actually, uh, you know, you can see here top left. I'm also on the trial version. You see, twenty four days left. I downloaded yeah. it a week ago. But that's exactly what I did. I click on the installer, and then when it asks for a license, I said, "Try it now." Yeah. Um, so yeah, it should be pretty simple. Okay. Any other quick and dirty questions? Rapid fire. Can you turn um, off your screen share? Please? Yes. Of course. Sorry. Um, stop. I just I just wanted to mention uh, uh, Alice. Alice mentioned that she might be using a, a different software. Yeah, that's totally uh, that fine. she's familiar with. I, I, I think that's fine, and I think like as it happened in the first week, I think it's also uh, interesting to collect all these resources. So feel free to share in Discord, and we're gonna put them all yeah. in a common document. It's also like it's also like a chance to test alternatives. So I think it's uh, interesting. Yeah, definitely. If you're familiar with other software, like I said in the beginning, there are many of them. So if you're familiar with another platform, feel free to use your own workflow. We'll be, you know, interested in comparing different techniques. But you can also go through this this workflow and try to learn a new sort of software if you wanted to. So you know, whatever floats your boat is good with us. Um, yeah, I think uh, I, we're, I think it worked quite well last um, last workshop where we were sharing notes in Discord, and we'll keep this document as a place where we kind of put some of the main links and um, information. So just um, keep it all there. And as you guys come across maybe interesting um, notes or findings or problems, uh, we'll you know keep that chat open. Um, I think. I think one thing to just emphasize is the experimentation part, right? Um, oh yeah, for sure. It, there's there's a there's there's the aspect of obviously trying to choose what object to to capture, but I think um, you know I would almost encourage trying a couple because then you see the differences between them all. Um, and there are things that that we didn't really talk about in terms of like what makes a good capture in terms of the surfaces. Max, you brought up really quickly, but like shiny things yeah. are a lot harder. Um, but you know, I think you learn those lessons through trial and tribulation. Definitely, stay away from windows if you can, and very very shiny surfaces like cars. Uh, or if that's if that's your interest, you can try and you'll see the results. <laughs> so, um, 
But usually, yes, uh, you're right, Danny. Um, shiny materials and transparent materials aren't necessarily very good because uh, it, it, there's a lot of variation in the texture as you move around it, essentially. And it, the camera, the, the software cannot recognize the features of something that's shiny because it's very reflective as, as you turn around it. So usually you want to try not a very matte sort of um, textured opaque materials. Those will give you the better results or a more precise result. Um, and it's up to you to define really what constitutes a good capture. Uh, and that's what we'll be interested to see. Just a question about that, actually. Um, have you had, in terms of lighting, uh, in Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Is it better, like, overcast days as opposed to direct sunlight? Yeah, yeah. No, you're totally right. I think an overcast midday uh, light is the best. You Because what you want to avoid, obviously, is, you know, dark uh, space, but also shadows, because shadows will make their way into the model, right, because they'll be in the photograph. So if you want a, like, very clean and shadowless, um, uniform model, you will want to try to find an overcast or a lot of, in, you know, diffuse lighting sort of environment. Um, but, you know, I understand that weather is a changing thing, so uh, it'll be up, you know, it's up to your own environment to decide what kind of lighting you're going to get. But yes, you know, try to avoid direct sunlight if you don't want to have too many shadows. Um, Dan also always recommends to have, using your phone, to have the automatic, um, oh, the, it's like an auto light and stuff. When you hold down, when you're on your phone, if you hold down, right. it sets the light as something constant yes. and it doesn't sort of focus in and out. Exposure, like out exposure. Yeah, that's a good trick. You want to try to get your lighting to be as uniform as you want throughout your capture. Um, if you have like automatic set contrast settings to re you know, reset your white balance on every frame, it'll it'll give you a, a very sort of patched result in the end with different sort of lighting and applied to your texture. So you, you don't want to be a, a, an extremely good photograph. You just want to be you, it, the, the photographic uh, aesthetic is not really what we're after. We're just you know, we're looking for dull, plain and simple. Let's see everything kind of you know capture. That's what you want. That's what we would give you the best. Uh, fill out for a second, but I don't know if it was just mentioned because I heard it here, but um, you know you can lock the exposure on your phone when you're taking pictures, right? right? Just yeah. by holding it um, until it says like AEAF lock, and I find that helps a lot. Um, That's true. Um, Max, I don't know if you mind me talking about non-objects. Um, I think you mentioned the facade, but I, but I also there's, you know, there's there's walking around an object and capturing it, which I think is the most effective and kind of the easiest to understand method. But there's also, you know, you can kind of take a, a bit of a sweep of a surface. Um, so you, you, let's say you want to get a facade and you kind of capture in a straight line, maybe back and forth, the same way you would do an object, but obviously you only get one side of that, right? Uh, yeah, essentially, you know, Agisoft will give you something uh, no matter what, and that something is what will be in your photos or your frames. If 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 it sees it, it's going to incorporate it. If it doesn't, then it won't be there. It's, mm -hmm. it's you know as simple as that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's curious to to think like capturing doors or something, right? So you you have a one side of a door, and you can cut it out when you when you trim everything in Agisoft, but. You know, there's also there's also those those type of objects which might um, not be fully three dimensional because you can't get all around them, but there's still something I think we can try there. Um, yeah. And and remember, everybody, it's the same thing about the first um, workshop. It's it's up to you to um, kind of share your environment, share your interests, share your.
curiosities, and so this is that this is that opportunity, right? Um, there is no there is no dictation from our side on what what it is you should be capturing. It's the moment to kind of say, hey, this is what I found really interesting about my my home environment, my neighborhood, my um, my community. So right. I encourage I you think, to push that. Yeah, what I'm really interested yeah, in it, seeing is, oh, go for it, Jen. I'm so delayed. I'm so sorry about this. No, but I also wanted to. I also wanted to emphasize this aspect. I think, uh, although it might appear as a purely objective process, where you capture, you know, reality under brackets, I think there's a huge uh, layer of uh, uh, selection and, and creativity in uh, what you decide to capture, and how that relates to your experience of your neighborhood. Uh, yes. Even you know, I think this is, it's all about the small uh, details um, of your street that maybe no one else notices, but have a particular significance for you. And I yes. think also when you start adding this further layer of the soundscape, which suddenly places that object in a particular moment in time, that that um, file, that media file, becomes a real personal expression so take it as a, as a, as an expressive exercise and not just a, a pure recording yeah my... I, was, uh, I was i was going to say the same thing jan summed it up pretty well um tarini is asking a question about burst shoots like can you can you turn your settings to the burst camera and then just kind of walk and have a lot of oh yeah yeah definitely I did find that if you're using an iPhone with the Photos app, that it's, I don't know how you extract individual images because you get kind of like a video file instead. Thank you so much. Um, so I would, I would test that. Um, just, you know, make a test, see if you can actually extract the photos. Um, right. If you get a video file, you'll be able to extract the frames. Yeah. Um, it's you know, like a weird more... Apple proprietary file, though. It's strange. I don't know. Test it out. It's that'd be that'd be great to know if that actually works. Yeah, yeah, it's, I'm same. I'd be curious. I actually never thought about that. That could be a clever sort of discovery. And just to also re remind everyone, this is we're talking about photogrammetry right now. But for for Wednesday's workshop, um, just to reemphasize the the audio capture, and I think all the same points um, stand in terms of just what you want to capture and why. Um, just think about your audio environments and how that um, is something I think to, to take some time to to reflect on. You know, um, we're we're talking about looking at things, but also we need to start establishing how we listen to things. Um, and I'm curious to see, you know, in this if we get it to Unreal, if we get it if if we get it to the program where we can all have this stuff working together. It's nice to see not only a visual kind of city collage from all over the world, but also an audio collage of our different sounds. You know, every every police siren um, across the world has a slightly different tone to it, a different um, uh, ring. And I think it's interesting to see uh, kind of our collective sound environments. Um, everyone's birds in their backgrounds are always sound a little different wherever they are. Mm -hmm. um, I'm getting a request from Rebecca to share a project which we did together, Max, which you didn't show. Um, she wants to see Skull Rock. I, I just Skull pulled it up. Oh my God, do you have it? I have to yeah, pay have, for it. I have it. I'll pull it up. Um, we did that. We did. Can you see my screen? No. 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 Sorry, my thing crashed. And now everything's thrown off. Um, sorry, it's also frozen. Sorry, guys. Oh, Danny, I see in two places. It's it, <laughs> it keeps on crashing. Um, I 
Um, can you see it now? Yeah. You see the website? Yes. OK, so Skull Rock was a project that that's, um, we all did together um, when, we, when we were at SIRC. And it was actually looking at a crowdsourced version of photogrammetry. Mm -hmm. So we, we, scoured, we scoured the internet for every picture of Skull Rock, which if, you, if you're from California, from Los Angeles, you, you're probably familiar with. It's a, it's a um, destination in Joshua Tree, uh, which is a national park. Um, and uh, it's one of the most kind of uh, famous spots. You know, it's on the side of the road as you're driving through. Everyone stops off and gets a, a picture in front of this giant rock that looks like a skull. Um, and we looked through Instagram, we looked through Flickr, and we were able to to make a code that would download all of the all of the images, and we used that as our input. Um, and we got our photogrammetry model, which was somewhat like like this. Um, and this is a this is a voxelized version, so it's not a mesh, it's not a point cloud, but it's a voxel, which is a whole other realm, which which I don't think we have the time to get into. But it's sort of like, what's the video game that uses voxels? Uh, uh, Minecraft. Minecraft. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I was totally blind. I like Minecraft. Yeah. Um, and then we took that information and took it back into Street View, so we we were able to locate where all the photos came from, put put the model in its original location, and um, uh, where is it? Um, and also then go back into the scene and. You know, as you see where all the photos were taken, more or less. Obviously, there's some misalignments, but you can see where everyone took their photos of Skull Rock, and how that creates this kind of public, public capture of um, an object like that. So, you know, I've seen a couple of other cases like this with monuments. We've talked a lot about um, monuments in the past week in terms of uh, what's happening with um, a lot of monuments being taken down. Um, I've seen people uh, trying to do the same thing, but for um, public monuments. Anyways, it's really interesting, fascinating. I think come Friday, we'll, we'll, it'd be nice to open up and talk about um, more uses or examples of, of photogrammetry. Yeah. Agreed.